Um, thanks for sticking around. Uh, the movie starts at 4, so we still have a little bit of time left. And we didn't put it on the schedule because we weren't sure it was going to happen. But uh, we are lucky enough to have Edward Snowden join us for a quick conversation about digital security. So if we can get him up on the monitors, there he is. Hey, Ed, can you hear me? I can hear you. So I've, I've also invited Chris Segoyan, uh, ACLU's principal technologist, to come back up here uh, to ask a few questions as well. And, uh, but I think we should start off by kind of talking uh, a little bit about how much things have changed before we get into what we still have to do. And um, Ed, I was wondering your thoughts on, on what the biggest change you have seen since you, know, you first tried to get Glenn Greenwald to set up PGP famously, and how journalists uh, interact with security tools now. I would say the biggest difference that I've seen is that people now take it seriously. Um, it used to be considered that uh, network security, computer security, online security, uh, any kind of communications security uh, was, was sort of the realm of the paranoid of conspiracy theorists because really who was watching us, who cared? Um, now we realize that because it's simply cheap and easy, uh, it's done really without thinking, without any particular individualized cause, uh, individualized suspicion, to monitor any one individual in particular, uh, just as a byproduct of using uh, the internet or, say, our phone networks domestically in the United States, uh, international switching systems, uh, or even connecting to you know, the, uh, the wireless access point on a plane, you are living behind a sort of digital trail, which may or may not be used against you down the road. Um, since that time, we've seen a, a, a sea change, not only in the implementations of communication security around the world, but I would say we've seen a change in attitudes, and that's been far more significant in terms of impact. Uh, we've seen companies like Yahoo, uh, like Google, like Facebook, all moving in uniform toward SSL. We've seen companies like Apple increasingly challenge the government's prerogatives on uh, sort of backdoor surveillance because they've gone, the security of American products and services is more important than access to a drag net. I mean, if they really want to be able to access uh, somebody's account or somebody's email, they can get a warrant. They don't need to just have it in a bucket where it's easy to sift through. And that is really the gift that keeps on giving. I know uh, Chris, who, who's out there, I can't actually see you guys on the stage, I can hear you. Um, but I know Chris, who's over there, has done actually a significant amount of campaigning to get a number of uh, top-tier providers to adopt uh, encryption by default for network communications, basically for data in transit. When you go to your Facebook page now, when you go to a Yahoo search, when you go to a Google search, those things can no longer be intercepted off the wire. You know, that stuff can't be taken for granted. Uh, it's a lot more effort. Now they have to go to the providers, or now they have to hack your endpoint. By endpoint, I mean your phone, your computer, uh, the actual device that you have, and that puts things in a much more uh, a much more fair, much more even legal grounding, because we we begin to we begin to enforce the Fourth Amendment uh, not through letters on a page, but through the design of our systems. And I, I would say that's the most significant change we've seen. Ed, this is uh, this is Chris. So um, we have had several panels today. Uh, in which reporters uh, and, and technical folks have all complained about the usability of security tools. Everyone tries to use PGP for the first time uh, and stumbles <laughs> and comes away, even if they figure out how to use it, they come away hating the experience. Um, right. But for many of us, uh, encryption tools are a, um, are a side activity. You know, we, we may encrypt a few emails or have a few encrypted phone calls, but the vast majority of our, our communications are not encrypted and, and the vast majority of our daily lives are not spent using um, anonymity, an anonymizing technologies. Now, in your case, your life has been on the line, uh, and your, at least your freedom has, has been on the line, uh, and so you've had to employ these and similar tools as your only technology. You know, right. I, it's, it's my belief that you, know, you are using these kinds of technologies all day long, and you're not, you know, you're not browsing the web in, in clear text. If, if these tools have been so frustrating for reporters, can you say what the last year of your life has been like using nothing but <laughs> uh, privacy-preserving tools? Well, if you've, uh, if you've ever had to use PGP, if you've ever had to generate your own key, yeah, as you say, it's not a fun experience. 
Um, and for someone in my situation, where, for example, the United States government's been writing letters where they say they promise not to torture me, um, this situation's a little bit different. So I, I do have to take it more seriously. I don't think I've used a naked internet connection um, since the initial revelations. I mean, since, since long before that, in fact. Uh, I use common anonymity technologies, the same ones that, that people in the audience uh, and people on the panels that they have been advocating, I'm sure, uh, technologies such as Tor uh, every day. Um, right now, for example, I'm not using regular DNS, I'm using encrypted DNS. Uh, and that's because even when you're coming out of a particular uh, jurisdiction, even when you're doing this, that, and the other, there's filtering that may not be done for the purpose of surveillance, but is also done for the purpose of censorship. Uh, and when we talk about the fact that these things are difficult, they're easy to use, or they're not easy to use, uh, this is a, a highly appropriate and important criticism that we need to we need to be more vocal about. But we also need to remember that these tools are free. Uh, I have not used a paid uh, encryption service uh, for quite some time because obviously I can't pay for anything online without leaving some kind of digital trail and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm I, I live a completely open source existence. I use free tools that are publicly audited and used by everyone else. Uh, and this is, a, this is something that has, has really put me in touch with the fact that these are crude. These are first generation. Um, many of these tools actually, in fact, almost all of these tools were developed before the revelations of last year. Uh, and they did not have a, an elegant understanding of what we in security call the threat model. Uh, that we really face today. For example, the Tor network, which uh, everybody sees as sort of the gold standard for uh, a mixed routing, an anonymous routing uh, network, uh, a mix net where you share your communications with other people in peering arrangement. Um, basically, when you're saying, I'll route traffic for you, you'll route traffic for me. And this way, we, we mix up our signals and lose the associations that are so identifying and so dangerous for people. Uh, Tor was designed without adversaries such as the NSA in mind. Um, and this is something we need to move beyond. But in order to do this, it's not going to come from typically a 15-year-old you know, in their basement designing this stuff in their spare time. It's going to have to come from grad students. Grad students are going to require grants. Uh, or we have to develop a market for this and ensure that commercial corporations actually have some kind of incentive to do this. And unless we do that, we're always going to have somewhat crude tools. We're always going to be a generation behind. Now, I, I see that beginning to change, particularly with smartphone security. We've seen things done by Open Whisper Systems, uh, the, these kind of programs, which are actually quite elegant. The encryption happens invisibly without the user being involved in it, but it's quite strong and it's actually been audited. Um, and this is what we need to move toward. Ed, uh, this is Chris again. I have one more question. Um, in the last few weeks, we've seen senior law enforcement officials, uh, Director Comey, head of the FBI, the Attorney General, uh, criticizing Apple and Google for building privacy into their products by default. And in a major speech at the Brookings in, uh, Institution just a couple weeks ago, Director Comey called on uh, these companies to build a front door into their systems. Uh, and he differentiated between a front door and a back door. He said that uh, a front door can be made secure, whereas a back door uh, cannot. In your experience as a, as a technical expert, is it possible to build a secure front door? And do you have any idea what the difference between a front door and a back door is? <laughs> there, there actually is no real difference between a front door and a back door. That's rhetoric. Um, speaking from a technical uh, level, as someone who worked for NSA, analyzing the activities of you know, uh, Chinese hacker teams, um, any kind of backdoor, any kind of flaw in a system can be found. Whether that's intended for law enforcement use uh, or whether that's intended for the subversion of people who design the system, a criminal group or a, a developer who wants some kind of backdoor access for testing, these things get found all the time and they make a product uh, completely unreliable and untrustworthy. For example, Cisco devices, Juniper devices, they build in capabilities uh, called law enforcement intercept capabilities. These are back doors that are intended to provide some kind of law enforcement capability for monitoring. But unfortunately, they're not very secure. They never have been. And intelligence agencies around the world use these to, to monitor each other 
And you'll typically see, when, when you work on sort of my side of the house, a whole bunch of intelligence agencies exploiting these same capabilities from a particular Cisco device or you know, that, that sort of capability. And it'll be in a hot spot of the world. You know, wherever the news cycle goes, everybody jumps on the same thing, and they're getting in each other's way. Now, the same thing can happen with criminal groups and third parties. Uh, and, and we've actually seen this happen in the past. It's open source. That we're talking unclassified things. There's the Athens affair that happened in Greece uh, many years ago, where I believe it was a... Uh, actually, I can't remember the manufacturer of the telephone switch, but it was the same thing. The critical infrastructure for Greece, their basically entire telephone infrastructure, had a backdoor, the same exact thing that Comey's asking for today. Uh, that was in their infrastructure, and it was exploited by an actor who, to date, has still not been identified. Now, they used this capability to wiretap the entire political branch of the Greek government, all of their highest officials, basically. Um, and this was for the entire course of the, the Olympic event. Um, you, you can Google it. Anybody in the audience with a smartphone with the Athens affair will be the second after the result. Um, and this is the danger. Uh, by creating front doors and back doors, uh, again, just back doors in our products and services, what we're doing is we're making the internet uh, more less secure on a fundamental level. You're making it less reliable. And this is a very, uh, very poorly considered strategy anybody in our government to be advocating, because the U.S. economy benefits more from the Internet than any other country in the world. If we start making the Internet, from which we derive so many jobs, so much growth, so much of a national advantage in terms of intellectual property, online services, digital rights, um, and, and just products overall, we are going to lose the most. And other countries are not going to do the same thing with their products. And they're going to have a national advantage on the international forum. I mean, who is going to buy an iPhone that's got a back door built into it when the Greek uh, phone, the German phone, the Korean phone, you know, you buy a Samsung device instead of an Apple device, it can be trusted. Uh, that, that's the fundamental problem. And ultimately, when Jim Comey asks for a front door, we simply need to remind him he already has it. It's called a warrant. Um, and even with an encrypted phone, you can, law enforcement officials can seek warrants, and there, there's some regulatory uh, disputes going on about this right now, and hack into the phone to gain the encryption key to decrypt the phone. Uh, and I mean, this isn't like a dark art, this isn't rocket science, it's uh, rocket science. We did this every day, uh, and I believe that, I'm sure that continues today. So, Ed, you talked about um, awareness, and there's been a, a much greater awareness with reporters as far as security goes. And we've been hearing that all day. Uh, and, you know, there's so many more reporters now using PGP email encryption. Uh, but what do news organizations as institutions have to do? What's the next step? Uh, you know, we see a lot of ad hoc interest in it by individuals. Um, but as far as organizations go, we haven't seen that much movement. So, for example, you know, hardly any uh, news websites are HTTPS by default. Uh, you know, a year and a half after uh, the leaks first started. Right. A, a lot of this is uh, structural. It's due to the technologies that are deployed for ad tracking and, and the monetization of the sites. And this is due to the fact that we, we really haven't had um, private corporations make that same ease of use commercially available and normalize it. Uh, there are advances being done with encrypted search and whatnot, but that's really going to be too broad for, I, I imagine, the audience uh, that's around here. The real key is we need journalists and institutions to look around and ask themselves, do they want to be condemned to having to fight with organizations with an intelligence community in the United States that's got a $75 billion a year budget uh, just to report the news? And if they don't, they, they can't simply try to use the insurgent tactics of making their communications more secure, of training all of their sources as if they're you know, world-class spies. Uh, and they need to push on regulations. They need to go, look, is it, are these really the values of our nation? You know, the editorial boards need to stand up and go, do we really have to fight our government to hold it to account? You know, do we really have to make everything a combat? simply to have an off-the-record discussion with an official? 
do we have to worry about, you know, Bob Litt and everybody else at the DNI uh, setting out these memos that say, hey, look, if you guys talk to a reporter, even if it's innocuous, even if it doesn't talk about classified information, even if it doesn't implement, implicate national security, and you're not uh, our public affairs office, that's not only a firing offense, it'll catch you in an investigation. These are, these are really policy decisions. These are social decisions. Um, that this is why we have a press, is to actually push back on these and ask the questions publicly and more critically to demand answers from officials. When the FBI director, for example, says, I want a front door in every phone that's manufactured in this country, we need to go, why? Is it, is it really necessary? I mean, when he says, because of this reason, that reason, the other, we need to get experts to respond in the papers. We can't simply keep it, you know, confined to lawyers. Uh, because ultimately, when we're talking about uh, issues of encryption, lawyers can't give the best answers. I mean, you need somebody who's actually studied this sort of thing. And ultimately, there may be no good answers, and that, that's often the case when it comes to these sort of uh, complicated, nuanced conversations. But if we don't demand answers from the government, if we don't get officials to actually sit down and commit to discussing this with technical experts as opposed to some uh, appointed czar somewhere, uh, we're not really going to get the best quality decisions, and we're not going to have the best quality government. Uh, this, is, this is Chris again. Uh, so we are in the museum, which is uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue, about halfway between Congress and the White House. And... Uh, Earlier this summer, Newsweek ran a story in which they quoted from an ex-FBI official who said that foreign governments, a large number of foreign government intelligence agencies, use IMSI catchers catchers or stingray devices in the Washington, D.C. area to spy on those engaged in the, in the political process. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, and specifically, as far as I understand, no congressional office in this city uses encrypted email, uh, use encrypted telephones other than those working on the intelligence committees. Uh, no single member of Congress or senator's website supports HTTPS. And in fact, I think many of them block access to visitors coming from Tor. Should those engaged in the legislative process be uh, investing in digital security tools in the same way that journalists and, and some lawyers are now realizing that they need to? Uh, yeah, I, I think absolutely. I mean, just a few days ago, there was a report published in the Danish press. Uh, the United States didn't really pay attention to it in the media sphere, um, but in Denmark it was a big deal. That found that the British intelligence agency had been monitoring climate negotiations. Um, we saw something very similar last year with the NSA doing the same thing for an advantage. We're simply fooling ourselves if we think that our, our, our representatives in government can go along with this sort of... Uh, completely defenseless uh, business as usual mode of communicating. And if they're not allowing us to have uh, any kind of encryption connect encrypted connections to their websites so we can read about their policies, if we're not allowed to uh, schedule an appointment with our, our member of Congress, uh, and if members of Congress can't even communicate with each other securely, how are we going to be able to actually discuss substantive issues, not just socially, but even within, uh, within the executive, the legislative branch, uh, all these other parts of our government, if we are an open book to all of our adversaries? Uh, at the same time, we have kind of this very tight, closed information control mindset towards the public, where we you know, deny for the requests and everything like that. The only people who know what's going on in our government are our enemies. And, and I don't think that's a sustainable sustainable model. So, Ed, this is Trevor again. We're just about out of time. Um, but I just wanted to ask if you had any closing thoughts for the room. Um, you know, all day it's been, you know, reporters and technologists and lawyers kind of talking together, trying to get through these issues. Uh, some versed in encryption, some not versed in encryption. And, uh, you know, given your unique perspective, uh, do you have anything you want to uh, add before we sign off? One of the, I would say, most significant things that was, uh, that was not well understood about the events of last year was that it's not entirely about surveillance. Um, surveillance is the mechanism of understanding. But 
what we really saw was the beginning of the discussion about how the balance of power is shifting between the traditional institutions of our society, uh, institutions such as the press, um, the civil society more broadly, uh, the public, how we interact with our government. And what we've seen is sort of a trend toward governments that are increasingly uh, affording themselves in secret uh, greater powers, um, more and more authorities, without the consent or awareness of the public. And this is something that if we allow it to continue, uh, and we don't have really, we don't have much visibility onto the activities of our government, the decisions of our representatives, uh, we can't, we can't make informed decisions about the kind of policies we want. Now we can resist uh, and, and try to enforce our rights on the technical level, which is what we're doing now. But by accepting that as the status quo, we're backfooting the idea of a free press. You know, we're saying. The press is, is now an insurgency. You know, they, they have to operate sneaking around in, in parking garages, uh, ditching their cell phones behind them, and, and trying to teach everybody to be the same way. Now, that is effective, um, and this stuff will allow you to report. And it's important to, that we create this body of knowledge. Uh, and we had a cadre that, of, of, of public interest journalism, of investigative journalists, who can make sure to train people who need this uh, when, when we're talking about stories that truly are adversarial, that are controversial, but we need methods of, of gathering this information regardless of opposition. But we have to accept that this is not the way it should be. And when we're talking about journalists, uh, we're talking about people who shape opinion. We're talking about people who really uh, have the ability to illustrate what the future should look like and what it could look like. And ultimately, that will allow us, if we, if we plead toward that, uh, we can remember that with all of these tools, with all of these developments, with all of our increased knowledge, we can protect ourselves when it's necessary, but we can also ensure that it doesn't have to be necessary here. And instead, we can use our skills to train people uh, in, in less liberal countries where they really do have to, have to be concerned about whether they're going to catch not just indictment, but hope. Um, and, and so I may say everything that people are doing here is, is, is critical. We need to know this, but we should never accept this as ordinary business. Great. Well, on that note, we will let you go. I know it's the middle of the night there, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. See you then. Thank you.